So I'm going to talk about a few um, different bits and pieces and uh, hopefully leave it enough time for, for questions. And I think as Ali was saying earlier, the background is, is clear that you know, now in textbooks up to 10% of uh, adult patients with cancer fail to achieve adequate pain relief despite optimization of uh, regimes of systemic analgesics. And it's said that interventional techniques should be considered really as adjuvant uh, therapy alongside the WHO analgesic ladder. And for any anaesthetists in the, the audience, the review there at the bottom is from uh, February uh, 2014, the BGA uh, educational supplement, and it's a review that includes a review of chordotomy. Okay, so a recent UK experience suggests that despite optimization of systemic analgesics, 11% of patients in the hospice setting were considered for some form of interventional uh, therapy. And sign guideline 106 from 2008 states that any patient with difficult to control pain, despite optimal management of systemic oral therapy, should be assessed by an anaesthetist with an experience in pain medicine for consideration of an appropriate intervention. And I think it should also be an anaesthetist not just with expertise in pain medicine, but with reasonable links to palliative care uh, as well. And I'll come on to why I've got that personal opinion uh, shortly. Type of procedure? Well, I think multidisciplinary working is essential because these individuals uh, often have complex psychological and, and social needs and factors. And my own personal experience uh, from many years ago was on a number of occasions I was asked to provide a service within a hospice or to specific patients uh, to assist in that very difficult situation where the pain was poorly controlled. And the problem I had was that I only had a, a limited uh, repertoire of techniques and in some ways at that point in time I was trying to fit a technique uh, to treat a particular pain problem re rather than having what we have now in, in the local service with a, a broad assessment and a, a kind of a pool of expertise. So I think it's important to have this, this link of anaesthetists with palliative care rather than necessarily anaesthetists dipping in and out. Others may disagree, that's, that's just an opinion. The type of procedure, there's my dyslexic moment there, uh, depends on the type of pain problem, obviously. Depends on the operator, as I've mentioned, we've all, all got our weakness and strengths and uh, there are different things we can offer and different things that we have less experience of. Depends on patient choice, uh, clearly, because some of the interventions can have significant uh, impacts on different aspects of an individual's quality of life and function. And then there's a question whether a procedure should be reversible or neuroablative, and we'll come on to that. The procedure at the beach, and the procedures at the beach, and the intrathecal drug delivery service uh, Ali has talked about, there's very good evidence, and uh, I don't, did you mention the, the Smith study? There was, there's, as well as there been a whole series of uh, case uh, reports and case studies uh, demonstrating this an appropriate approach, there have been a, a couple of studies, and the one that I remember um, best is the, the Smith study from 2002, I think, which uh, was a, a well-designed, randomised crossover study that considering this type of approach was as well conducted as it possibly could have been. And the outcomes were very, very favourable. And I recall that the outcomes, not just for analgesia and quality of life were favourable, but the outcome from the point of view of survival was significantly improved. And I think that's reflected in the patient that uh, Ali was uh, alluding to earlier, the individual who just recently died, having had the pump in for two years. When he first presented, he presented almost bedbound, uh, opioid toxic, with uh, very poor, uh, not just nutritional intake, but very poor fluid intake. So he went from a situation whereby it looked as if things were, were not going to continue for very much longer to a situation where he had a reasonably good quality of life for, for two years just because of the different way in which the analgesic, analgesic intervention was delivered to minimise the, the opioid uh, toxicity. There's lots of other procedures. Celiac plexus block is one of the ones we've undertaken most uh, frequently and, and that's been alluded to. 
The celiac plexus is a, a group of nerves that are uh, grouped deep within the abdomen, just uh, in front of the upper lumbar vertebra. And many of the, the nerves associated with pain uh, perception run through this area on, in the way to the central nervous system. So it's an area that has for a long time been a, a target of interventions, and particularly pancreatic cancer pain was mentioned. And we have undertaken quite a few of these, and the results have been reasonable. Again, they are just a kind of series of case reports, if you like. And the question there can be whether it's a local anaesthetic on its own. And the advantage of a local anaesthetic is, yes, it will work. It will provide reasonable analgesia. But of course, all local anaesthetics are um, limited in the time of their duration to really a number of hours. There might be some uh, developments that we've been talking about for many years of ways of uh, depot local anaesthetics, but regardless of that, it's still only going to be to uh, 12, 24, 40 hours at most, even with that. So one of the things we frequently add to these uh, types of blocks, including the celiac plexus blocks, are steroids to try and prolong the benefit. And whether that's through simply an anti-inflammatory process or a process of stabilising nerves, we don't know. So one choice for a reversible block is a combination of local anaesthetic and steroid. And yes, you can get reasonable results uh, for a reasonable length of time, but there's always a possibility of coming back and repeating the procedure. It's quite a, it's, it's a, reasonable, uh, a reasonably big procedure for an individual to, to undergo. So it's weighing up the risks and, uh, risks and benefits. It's also possible to undertake this procedure in an ablative approach by basically injecting alcohol or phenol to dehydrate and destroy nerves. And again, that can be very effective for a longer period of time. But the problem with any ablative technique is it's slightly uh, less controlled in the sense that it's possible for the alcohol to seep back towards the central nervous system and cause some complications from that point of view. And if you do ablate nerves over time as they grow back uh, or uh, regain their function, this can be associated with some degree of neuro neuropathic pain. So these single shot techniques for celiac plexus block can be of value uh, in my own mind, I'm still not 100% just how it settles in with, with everything else uh, we are doing. Regarding other approaches, there are a multitude of possibilities. And from single shot to continuous infusion, as in perioperative care. And in perioperative care, the evidence is quite good for many of the different things we do. But of course, in perioperative care, all the interventions are designed around a, a period of hours to days to take a patient through that uh, operative phase to, to mobilise and recover. So with many of our single shot techniques, there's a question again of how you uh, improve longevity. And as before with the celiac plexus block, we can consider the ad addition of a steroid, and that's something we frequently do, or a neuroablative approach. Um, one individual, for example, that we were going to undertake yesterday was a paravertebral blo block with alcohol. And that's basically just going lateral to the uh, vertebral column round about the ribs to block uh, a very painful area from a metastatic deposit at T7. And that's a reasonable indication for that type of approach. It turned out the, the individual unfortunately died uh, a couple of days before we didn't undertake the procedure. Um, but I think it kind of illustrates that there are a multitude of different possibilities. It's said that uh, for surgical procedures, you can find almost an anaesthetic approach for any type of procedure if you have a reasonably compliant patient. In a sense, it's possible to numb any part of the body. But again, the problem we have is that you're numbing for a time-limited uh, period. So it's finding ways of extending that into a more meaningful uh, time scale for the, the palliative care patient. Um, so there's a limited evidence base in the context of palliative care, but we have cautiously undertaken a few such procedures, and it's alluded to uh, quite a number of celiac plexus blocks and all the other ones, uh, again, mostly single figures, and we're just cautiously moving forward with these. But I think we're doing this from a much more kind of robust basis of a multidisciplinary approach working closely with palliative care rather than the way I worked in the past, which was kind of as, as a lone individual, if, if you like. I'd like to talk about the percutaneous cervical chordotomy, 
which is labelled PCC. And perhaps this does take a brain surgeon. And up until about three years ago, I'd thought, yes, it does take a brain surgeon. Until I was down in Liverpool and went with uh, Dr Mitchell to a talk uh, and discovered that, in fact, this was a procedure that was undertaken in four centres in the UK. And the individual who was talking was from Liverpool and he went through a, a, a series of 80 cases. And the results were really quite impressive. And the other thing that uh, impressed me was that the, the equipment he was using was, was equipment I was very familiar with and the approach he was using was something I thought, well, that's not out with my repertoire of uh, skills. I, I wonder if this is uh, in any way a, a possibility. We went down to visit Liverpool um, just about a year and a half ago and we, we saw a procedure and that's really what kind of has taken this interest forward. Historically, um, this goes way back to individuals called Spiller and Martin in the early 1900s and they observed that tuberculous lesions of the spinal cord could be associated with loss of pain sensation in a proportion of individuals. And uh, Spiller concluded that perhaps the pain could be relieved by cutting the pain pathway in the spinal cord and apparently the first open surgical cordotomy was carried out in 1905. And up until three years ago or two years ago, this was really my impression of what a cordotomy involved. It's a, an anterior approach to the spinal cord. It's quite extensive surgery and would re require really a very um, fit and robust individual uh, to be able to undergo that type of surgery. And that really didn't fit in with any of the types of patients we were seeing. On the other hand, the percutaneous cervical cordotomy is something that could be applied to our patient population. And it's, a, again, a technique I didn't appreciate. It had been around since the 1960s. And initially, they used radioactive needles uh, to cause a lesion in the spinal cord, but subsequently moved on to radiofrequency thermocoagulation. And I'd love to explain what radiofrequency is and how it works, but I don't really know. What I do know is that uh, through the machine, it generates a, a heat lesion on either side of the needle. So it's through some clever... Uh, physics process. And percutaneous cervical cordotomy ablates the sensory pathways of the lateral spinothalamic tract and is generally said to be safe and effective technique for unilateral pain below the clavicle. Again, that's from that uh, review. Indications, well, one of the main indications that we put forward was the notion that Percutaneous cervical cordotomy is particularly recommended for costal pleural syndrome in malignant pleural mesothelioma. And mesothelioma is still on the rise and will not peak until uh, around about 2020. So it looks as if there's a, this is going to be an increasing uh, clinical problem and PCC is one potential approach for this and it seems to be a, a, a very useful approach. And of course, in this part of the world, uh, mesothelium was a significant problem because of the industrial base and the shipyards. And albeit that was several decades ago, it takes that time for the, the, uh, the patient, the, the kind of disease burden to work its way through. The specific indications for uh, PCC are unilateral refractory cancer pain, below C4 dermatome, with a limited life expectancy of said to be less than one year, that again comes back down to that notion that you can lesion nerves, but over time there's some degree of regeneration, and as they regenerate, there's some degree of the potential for significant neuropathic pain to, to develop. They say that nociceptive pain responds best, if you like, but in our experience, because we have uh, not undertaken this procedure, but referred six or seven individuals down to Liverpool, um, a number of them have had significant neuropathic pain and still had a very significant benefit uh, from the procedure. The anatomy, well, the lateral spinothalamic tract lies kind of the the front outer part of the, the spinal cord and carries fibres for pain and temperature sensation from the opposite side of the body. And within the spinothalamic tract, it's not quite a homunculus, but there is a recognisable distribution of uh, nerves in relation to the different uh, areas of the body, if you like. And that can be very important uh, when it comes on to getting feedback from the patient as to where the needle is before you actually create the lesion. 
So with the percutaneous approach, it's a, a stepwise approach with feedback from the patient, whereas with a surgical approach before, the patient was asleep, and basically it was creating a lesion blind and then waking the patient up to see whether it had been successful or not. The other obvious thing about this, uh, the spenthalamic tract, is it's very superficial and close to the surface, the lateral surface of the cord, which makes it accessible through the side of the neck. This is not a picture of a, 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 a cordotomy, but it's just a picture from the internet. But in essence, it's the same notion with the individual lying in the back, image intensifier, and it's just basically a percutaneous approach with a needle. It's carried out under sedation. Um, we use X-ray to localise. We, we use X-ray. X-ray is local, used to localise where the individual is uh, undertaking the block. And the patient needs to lie in the back for at least 45 minutes, sometimes longer. Uh, the sedation can be decreased to a certain extent to get feedback from the patient at the appropriate time during the procedure. The procedure itself, uh, and the one we saw, it seemed uh, obviously a very skilled operator, but it did seem relatively simple and relatively straightforward. With the RF needle, which is a very fine needle, being introduced through, through, uh, under aseptic technique to the C1, C2 interspace and guided by X-ray, and you can see the needle actually lying with the, the round hub um, just to the, the left of the needle of the, the end of the arrow of the B with the, the needle pointing towards the end of the arrow with the, the, the D. The D marks a dentate ligament, which is a ligament that runs down, uh, splitting the, 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 the CSF and the spinal cord anterior to posterior. You inject um, a contrast dye to help confirm you're naturally in the anterior aspect of the, the, the spinal cord. So the steps would be to insert the needle, get a flow of CSF to determine you were within the, um, the subarachnoid space, and then advance the, the, the lesion part of the needle in towards the spinal cord um, after having injected the contrast dye to check position. There's then the possibility or the, the need to uh, stimulate the, need, the needle and get feedback from the patient to refine position. So with the patient, decreased sedation, they're asked where they feel the sensation. And if they feel it typically around about the hand, it means you're in the middle area of the spinothalamic tract. In essence, then the patient's asked to, to raise their arm and the lesions are created in a stepwise manner. Uh, the reason they're asked to raise the arm is that obviously if you were too close to the motor fibres, you might get immediate feedback uh, that you were editing those and you could stop before uh, completing the lesion. So it's kind of, it seemed to me, although it's a, a very invasive procedure, um, it seemed relatively simple and straightforward in a nice controlled stepwise uh, manner. The equipment's uh, very familiar, it's something that we, we all use on a day-to-day a, a -day basis. Um, and this interpretation of response to, to motor and sensory stimulation is crucial to the procedure. Sequential lesions are created, as, as I mentioned, and the success of the procedure, procedure really is apparent really immediately. So you can get immediate feedback, you can check for uh, hypoalgesia with a pinprick within the treated area to ensure you've created a, a significantly large lesion without the lesion extending into other groups of nerves to cause problem with uh, power or other sensory loss. Now come there are several case series and as I say um, two years ago when I went to Liverpool um, the individual there presented a case series, I think it was 80, 88, uh, with really quite impressive results. And there are similar, similar case series from other parts of the country. Our own experience at the Beatson, we've referred down either six or seven patients uh, to Liverpool. And um, the, the most recent patient was followed down by one of us. And the outcomes there are really very impressive. Um, there is a failure rate. There's a failure rate that the procedure might not uh, work. Perhaps the individual uh, is unable to lie uh, long enough. Um, perhaps there's some degree of edema during the lesion and it then resolves and some of the pain comes back. Uh, perhaps the, um, it's unable to actually uh, get correct placement of the needle. 
um, and that's operator dependent and obviously the less experienced the operator is, the higher the chance of not being able to actually get correct placement and they say it can be as high as one in three initially and that's some element of a learning curve. There are uh, not quite training packages in place but between the, the four centres in the UK there's some degree of agreement on training individuals up so that people can go and get experience in an age controlled manner and hopefully uh, when they undertake the, the practice all of their own accord, if you like, the failure rate should be relatively low. Complications, I've written uh, minor complications in inverted commas uh, because these minor complications are common. They're, they're described as minor, perhaps they're minor in the context of the individuals uh, who have re very, very severe pain and lots of other morbidities, but the complications do include some degree of motor weakness uh, and the side associated with the pain. Uh, it is possible to cause some degree of bladder or bowel upset, although that's very uncommon. There is a loss of uh, pain sensation in that side. There's also a loss or diminished uh, temperature sensation, which apparently is not a, a terrible problem for individuals, but more uh, disconcertive if they go for a bath. One half of the body will register in hot or cold and the other won't. Um, mirror pain, whereby you create the lesion to remove pain from one part of the body for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me or fortunately anyone else, cause a, a neuropathic pain mirroring on the other side of the body that they say is only temporary, uh, although in a small proportion of patients it can persist. It said that life-threatening complications are rare, less than 1%. And all of this together has uh, led us to put an application into the the NSD, National Service Division of uh, Scotland, to create a national service uh, for cardotomies. There, are, there is a service already in Scotland in Aberdeen. The, the numbers they have are relatively low and what we're planning to do or what we are doing is putting in a joint application with them uh, to take this forward. Do you have questions?